The year is now 2022. COVID-19 continues to rampage through the medical world. Emergency use authorized vaccines safeguard those who have received them, but what recourse does someone have if that is not enough? Does Pfizer have another tool up its sleeve to combat coronavirus? And is it the right one for you or someone you take care of? All of that and more right after this title screen. Hello folks, and welcome to this drug information video on Paxlovid, a new drug from Pfizer being used to treat COVID-19. My name is Patrick, I'm a pharmacy student at the time of this recording, and I'll be your presenter for this video. This video has two parts, part one being general information that you should know as someone who might be taking Paxlovid, and part two being a professional deep dive into the finer details on the drug fact sheet. Before we begin, I want to emphasize that this video is for only educational purposes, and your healthcare professionals can help you navigate and understand the information landscape as it changes over time. Be sure to talk with your healthcare professionals about decisions regarding your treatment options so that they can help you pick the best one for your specific situation. Now then, let's start with the basics. Paxlovid is the brand name of a drug combination, which is really hard to say, but it's pronounced Nermaltravir and Ritonavir. This drug comes in packaged kits of three tablet doses, and is currently emergency use authorized for the treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19. On screen now is what the packaging will probably look like. There are three oval-shaped tablets, two of which contain Nermaltravir and are colored uh, pink, while the third one contains Ritonavir and is colored white. If you have damaged kidneys, you might find that your pharmacist has removed one of the pink tablets in each dose to account for it. And this is normal if that's the case. Now, before getting a prescription for Paxlovid, it's important to discuss several things with your doctor. First off, you should understand that Paxlovid is only under emergency use authorization. While this means Paxlovid hasn't been fully approved by the full-fledged process of the FDA, given the urgency of oh, I don't know, a rapidly spreading viral pandemic that the world is pooling its collective time and resources towards addressing faster than previously possible, the FDA has reviewed enough evidence and research done during the pandemic to give a sort of temporary pass for Paxlovid to be used since it has proven to be reasonably safe and effective so far. Since there isn't an adequate, approved, and available alternative for now, they will continue to monitor new data and consider which options are working the best as time goes on. But until then, you must meet the following eligibility criteria. Now, if you test positive with a mild to moderate case of COVID-19 to receive a Paxlovid prescription, your prescriber needs to make sure that you are 12 or older, weighing at least 88 pounds, that's 40 kilograms in metric, have a high risk of having severe COVID-19 or being hospitalized for it if you are left untreated, and that you are able to start taking Paxlovid within five days of your symptoms appearing to ensure that this can be effective. I go on more about this in the advanced section as to why this is the case. It's worth noting that getting a severe case of COVID-19 is more likely if you haven't yet received an emergency use authorized COVID-19 vaccine that can either prevent or weaken a COVID-19 infection. Besides the formal requirements, you should let your prescriber know about any medications that you are taking, as they could potentially interact with Paxlovid, causing side effects or the medicine to not be as effective against COVID as it should be. And this should go without saying, but if your pharmacies can't get a hold of a supply to dispense to you, you probably want to find other options. Have your prescriber's office help with finding a pharmacy that can get Paxlovid to you within that five-day window. Alright, so, assuming that you are able to get this medicine, how do you take it? Well, Paxlovid tablets are just taken by mouth, with or without food. The doses are taken twice a day, which is best taken roughly 12 hours apart, one in the morning, one in the evening. If you miss one, take it as soon as you remember, as long as there's still at least four hours or more until the next dose. Oh, and uh, don't double dose to make up for a missed one. Just take the regular dose. When taking your three tablet dose, you can take the three tablets one after the other. It doesn't have to be swallowed all at the same time. Just make sure you swallow them whole without chewing or crushing them. This will ensure that the drug works correctly. It's also worth noting by that same token that when you are taking this drug, do not stop until you have finished your entire drug regimen. 
even if you do feel better. Now when storing your extra doses, keep it in a place that's cool, dry, and protected from excessive light or curious children. I always like to remind folks that the bathroom cabinet is usually the worst place for pills, since it tends to be moist, warm if you're a fan of hot showers, and probably easier for a child to get into than you think. Alright, let's get into our side effect forecast for Paxlovid here. We find that our usual suspects is a changed sense of taste, diarrhea, elevated blood pressure, and the headaches or other symptoms that usually come with it, and muscle pain. Uh, these aren't all guaranteed, by the way. You might experience only maybe two, one, or even no side effects at all while taking Paxlovid, but uh, we won't know for sure until you start. These side effects usually go away after finishing the treatment, similar to other medicines. There are some more serious things to watch out for while taking Paxlovid, but luckily we know a few things to look out for and what to do about it. Like any other medication, if you, specifically, have an allergic reaction to it, like hives, rash, or feeling like it's hard to breathe, seek emergency help immediately. The same thing goes for accidentally taking too much Paxlovid and feeling worse as a result. You might find it handy to have your area's poison control phone number available, if you don't already have it. For those that are on birth control, we should note that Paxlovid could reduce the effectiveness of hormone-based birth control medications, so if necessary, use effective alternative methods. Uh, lastly, St. John's Wort is an over-the-counter product that can reduce the effectiveness of Paxlovid by making the liver break it down faster. It's best to avoid it while taking Paxlovid. And for now, that's pretty much all you need to know. Here's a summary so that you can screenshot it for your reference later. All of the information referenced in this video comes from the Emergency Use Authorization Fact Sheet, available on the website on screen. You can scan the QR code for your convenience. Alright, so the next part can get confusing if you don't have a medical or science background, so as mentioned before, if you need help navigating the medical information landscape, see your healthcare professional such as your doctor or pharmacist. Now then, with that out of the way, let's take a deeper dive into the rest of Paxlovid's fact sheet in more detail. Paxlovid is a combination of nermaltravir and ritonavir, two protease inhibitors. Nermaltravir is the main player here, directly inhibiting the main protease of SARS-CoV-2, preventing viral replication. Ritonavir is on board, but mainly as a SIP dummy substrate to maintain increased plasma concentrations of nermaltravir. It is normally used in HIV treatment. Currently, Paxlovid is not FDA approved for any use. It is only under Emergency Use Authorization, or EUA. This is due to there being no approved and available alternative during this qualifying public health endangering pandemic. The EUA covers for treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 in patients 12 years and older, weighing at least 40 kilograms, and are at risk for developing severe or getting hospitalized for COVID-19. The EUA allows the prescriptions to come from physicians, advanced practice registered nurses, and licensed or authorized physicians assistants. Note that this may not be prescribed under the EUA as pre- or post-exposure prophylaxis. The patient must test positive to receive it. As of right now, clinical trials are still ongoing and available for review on clinicaltrials.gov. For other emergency use therapeutics for COVID-19, visit fda.gov. The fact sheet goes over the formal names for the side effects discussed in the patient section, including dyscusia, diarrhea, hypertension, and myalgia. The main serious adverse reaction listed is hepatitis, which of course comes with symptoms such as jaundice or increased LFTs if you happen to be aware of a patient's lab values. Given the nature of the ritonavir component, there are listed warnings on the fact sheet for increased risk of HIV-1 resistance to HIV protease inhibitors in individuals with uncontrolled or undiagnosed HIV-1, and a use with caution warning exists for those with pre-existing liver conditions. Naturally, the pharmacokinetic profiles of Paxlovid's constituents features hepatic clearances through CYP3A. Patients on concomitant inducers or inhibitors may need dose adjustment or therapy modifications to account for the contraindications or interactions listed on the fact sheet. Speaking of which, let's go over those right now. 
Since this hasn't been fully yet approved, uh, we have no black box warnings on the EUA monograph, but we do have contraindications to certain substrates and potent CYP3A inducers, such as the ever-infamous St. John's wort. Rifampin, phenytoin, and carbamazepine also come to mind. Assuming everyone's accounted for all of those contraindications and warnings, the regimen looks like this. Currently, under the EUA dosing, Paxlovid involves a 5-day regimen of 300mg of nermaltrevir, supplied in two 150mg tablets, and one tablet of 100mg of ritonavir, taken together twice a day. As it is now, one package of Paxlovid will have all five daily blisters of 30 total tablets for a single patient. It's not recommended to split packages as no other package sizes are available currently. For renal impairment, our GFR criteria is between 30 and 60. Patients will take one less nermaltrevir tablet for a total of 150 milligrams twice a day for the same duration of therapy. Beyond that, there are no explicit contraindications for hepatic or renal impairment, but the fact sheet does state that Paxlovid is not recommended for GFRs below 30 and child pew class C livers. For monitoring parameters, unfortunately there isn't anything specific for efficacy, but this makes sense. The, the whole point is to keep patients out of the hospital, and efficacy in this case is simply indicated by the lack of progression to severe COVID-19. Likewise, on the safety end, it's also what you would expect. Clinical trials are still collecting data, and so at this point monitoring for the listed adverse events and taking lab parameters like GFRs and NLFTs for renal and hepatically impaired populations respectively will be the tried and true once more. Okay, so with all of that, where does this leave Paxlovid? Well, for the American guideline associations that I'm personally familiar with, since I'm a student based in California currently, it seems a little too soon to say, despite early promises from the EUA. The Infectious Diseases Society of America, or the IDSA, carries a conditional recommendation for the use of Paxlovid. Um, this lines up with the additional commentary provided by the CE video from the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacists, or SIDP. Um, by the way, this is a great video to watch if you're interested in some of the trial data that they go over. They do a much better job of going into detail there. For now though, I'll end with some of my own takeaways here regarding Paxlovid. I think it'll be a great boon to hospitals if it ends up working out. Less severe cases means giving less chances for the virus to continue to replicate and mutate into the next headline variants. That said, it's no secret at this point that Paxlovid's pair of protease inhibitors need to make sure that nothing messes with them in order for them to work effectively. As such, their use potential is probably going to be kneecapped by their CYP3A interaction profile. The guideline writing societies and government regulators seem to all agree that more data is needed before they feel certain enough to lock this down as a mainstay, but no matter how much data is generated, I see Paxlovid being seated permanently behind vaccination as a second or even third line measure due to the data pointing towards diminishing returns in lower or moderate risk ambulatory COVID patients. Regardless though, in the meantime, Make sure that the pharmacy that fills your prescription is even getting it in the first place. The supply line disruptions have and will continue to wreak havoc on just about everything from computers to medicine, which makes collecting data for patients with symptom onsets greater than five days imperative if Pfizer wants to keep their second major COVID product relevant. And for now, that's all you need to know about what we know about Paxlovid so far. As mentioned before, the information cited in this video was pulled directly from the fact sheets on the emergency use authorization for Paxlovid. This video was filmed in January of 2022 and reflects the current knowledge of this medication at this time. For updated information, consult your healthcare professionals for updated guidelines and recommendations for the use of Paxlovid and the treatment of COVID-19. I've been Patrick, and whether you're a patient or a professional, Take care of yourself out there, and thanks for watching.